Church, turn to the book of Romans chapter 1 as we are continuing on in our introduction and diving into uh, the book of Romans. And uh, I'll read verse 1 of chapter 1. If you'll pick it up out of the New King James Version, uh, if you would, if you don't have that version, look to the screens. If you pick it up in verse 2, uh, we'll read down to verse 6 together. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <laughs> you read those first six verses, and you can already get a, a glimpse into the gravity and the scope of Paul's theology. I mean, look at the, just even in English, the, 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 the way that he has structured his argument. He gets so deep so fast that in those first six verses, he actually puts together in, in a miraculous form a grand overlay of the book. In fact, listen to this. Dr. Albert Barnes writes, For the purposes of systematic theology, it, that is the book of Romans, is the most important book in the Bible, more than any other. It has determined the course of Christian thought. That's a huge statement. Another great comment from a preacher of yesteryear, 1814, Professor Robert Findlay said, where is the Christian constitution? It is the book of Romans. To master its content is to be grounded and settled in the faith. That's a great word. In fact, some scholars will tell you that the book of Romans, you can take that book and commit to memory out of the 16 chapters, you should commit to memory 16 themes, one for each of the chapters. Because if you commit to memory the theme, for example, of chapter one, it is the depravity of man. Chapter two, you'll understand that it speaks about our inability to become righteous by the law. And he goes on all the way through. And listen, scholars tell you that if you get a grip on the book of Romans, then you have a grip on the Bible itself. Isn't that amazing? This is why the book of Romans theologically is the crowning pinnacle of our Christian endeavor uh, regarding Bible study. This is deep stuff. And I told you last week, there's a reason why we're doing this. And, and I don't mean this to be rude in any way, shape, or form. But uh, this church, uh, like other churches that, that are open and, and coming through the year of 2020, uh, there's been... Um, Abnormal growth, tremendous growth. Uh, but now's the time for us to make sure that as a church, we don't turn into some sort of a uh, spectacle. And to do that, what do we do? We go to the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans will teach the Christian what it is to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the doctrinal questions are going to get answered here. And that will, by nature, flush out uh, those who don't want to draw near to Jesus, that they just might maybe want to traditionally attend church on Sunday because there's nothing else on TV or whatever. I don't know. But listen, if all of you just put yourself and determine, I'm going to go through this book. I'm going to go, I'm going to start it, and I'm going to finish it. Well, then blessed are you because you're going to wind up growing like you've never grown before. And that's a promise that God gives us in his word. So we're going to jump in to where we left off last time, but this time we'll get into these points as we look to this study that is themed right now, called to be. Called to be. You're going to hear that over and over again in the book of Romans. Called to be an apostle. Called to be servants. Listen, called to be saints. Called to be. You're going to hear that. Why? Because what God communicates to you in the book of Romans is this grand invitation Grand invitation 
to even be called to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. A word that you would not normally mention in our day and age, would you? But the fact of the matter is, it's exactly what the Bible talks about, and we'll look at it this morning in our study. Called to be, number one in our consideration. Called to be. If we look at it, mark it down, church. Verse one opens up with the challenge for you and I to be a new man. Can you write that down? And if that bothers you, you can be a new man or a new woman, okay? But when I say man, I mean a, a new mankind, right? This is Christianity. And Paul's going to be speaking to us about what are we called to be? Well, the first thing is we're called to be a new man. And I love the romance that we see right here in the opening up of it. Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. What we see right out of this, mark it down if you would, is authority. It's, a, it's an issue of authority. As believers, we're called to be a, a new person. But the first thing that we need to realize is Paul being a great example for us is that Paul was invited by Christ into a new authority, a greater authority. So when he says Paul, a bondservant, we need to dissect the, these names of his Paul. Remember last week we got in the introduction, I said we might get to the opening P of the word Paul and maybe the L. Well, we didn't. So here we are now. Paul, the man Paul who used to be known as Saul. Saul in his Hebrew uh, language, Paul in his Greek or Latin language, Paul. We know him affectionately as Paul the Apostle, but he was not always Paul the Apostle. He wasn't born with some apostolic glow. He was born in the home of a wealthy Jewish family. We know that by the level of education that he had. We don't know if his parents or his family were diplomats, were they somehow... Uh, they themselves, Pharisees, somehow of, of uh, maybe uh, merchants. We don't know, but they were wealthy. And we know this by the level of education that he had. He was Saul of Tarsus, born a Jew, connected to the Hebrew world, very uniquely prepared, by the way. Born a Jew, directly connected to the Hebrew world. But listen, he was born in... Tarsus of Cilicia, which means that he was born into the empire, but thirdly, he was born a freeborn citizen, which means he came out, so to speak, of the womb with legal documents backing up his citizenship as a Roman citizen, which is extremely powerful. And we all need to take notice of that today. Every one of us have been brought into this world, and each of us have some form of influence that God has put in your life. And number one, we need to take a deep breath and realize that uh, I need to find out what that is. You need to find out what that is because it's part of what we're arguing about today. But it all comes down to authority. Saul, his authority, as you'll see today, was challenged by God and by himself. He had to take a look at it. And so when we think about Paul or Saul, the interesting thing is that he was no stranger to authority. Authority. He had been schooled in what is known as the Ivy League ins institutions of his day. Paul had been brought up under the, uh, the tutelage of uh, some masters, and one of them is Gamaliel himself, which is famous in secular history. But um, Paul also would have had what we refer to as a pedagogus or a pedagogy. You say, what is that? The word is schoolmaster. Uh, he had an in-house teacher that was assigned to him because of his upbringing. In other words, everywhere he went, all the time, there was someone there to be schooling and instructing him, even in between classes by these notable teachers. This guy was immersed in education. And I love that. But this pedagogus, his job was to do something like this. In fact, those of you who are public school teachers or those of you who are homeschool teachers, it doesn't matter. Kids' nature is the same. You always got to tell your kids, stop it. Stop looking out the window. Look back on here. Now, put that down. I said no right here now. We're doing, we're doing this now. And no, you, you can't have that until you finish this. Do you hear me? 
This is a, that's, that is a pedagogus. It, the, this, this one is a schoolmaster comes along and says, this is what you're going to learn next. And this is what you're going to learn after that. And it's my job. Your parents pay me to make sure you're the brightest. So here we go. And they drive and push and drive and push so that this person comes out on the other end after all of those years, having been under the authority, though this kid is heir to the throne, so to speak. Right? Think of it. There's this external source that has been purchased as an instructor in the house to raise up the kid. And Paul had that. And by the way, he's going to use that in future teachings. He's going to tell us that the law has been our pedagogus to drive us to Christ. That's a huge statement. If you're Jewish, by the way, I'm so blessed. Last service, last service, a man came to me and he said, I've been visiting. I've been coming here. And I'm Jewish. And he said, I don't know what's going on, but I have to keep coming here. And he started getting all emotional. He said, I don't know what's happening to my heart, but something's happening. And I said, I know exactly what's happening. You're going to find out more, and I'm going I'm to enjoy watching what happens to you. But uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is getting a hold of you. And that's what's going on. Why? Because the pedagogist, the Holy Spirit, takes the law of God that drives you. You know how the law is always poking you? You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And it frustrates you to the point where, this is driving me crazy. I, I can't take the pressure. And that's all by design. Because just like that teacher was desiring to get that student to graduate top of the class, so the law of God brings to the point of total absolute frustration to bring you to rise to the top of the class. How do you rise to the top of the class? I can't do this. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And the law is to drive you to a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul had been living a life very schooled in the law and very adept to authority. And he himself, of course, became a man of authority as a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee, which means that he had to be married. He was married once. We don't know whatever happened to his wife. Uh, maybe when he became a Christian, she left. That would have been normal in that culture. Maybe she died. We don't know. But he was a Pharisee, which means he was very, very knowledgeable of the Hebrew scriptures, a man of religious authority and power. We're going to see how much so in a moment. But authority is something that he would have understood. The word name Paul means uh, little one or of no uh, significance. That's his name, Paul. You say, what? Well, honestly, chrono in, in, a, in a chronological way, his name Saul meant that which is asked for or that which is requested for. Maybe, maybe it was his mother's prayer. God, I'm asking you for his son. And when he came out, maybe the parents named him Saul because he was asked for. It could also mean that he would be somebody that would grow up being desired by others, that they would ask for him. Whatever it is, Saul is a name of pride. A lot of Hebrew boys had the name Saul. But Saul met Jesus Christ and became Paul. He came from the one of being requested to the one whose name means very small, very little, insignificant. I want to submit to you this morning that the Bible is telling us that there was a great transformation that took place in this lofty intellect's life. And that is a very good thing. That's something that needs to happen. Let me run through some verses to kind of back that up for you. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Wow, think of Paul. Think of Saul being like the ISIS of the day. He was hunting down Christians and having them murdered for following Jesus. Went to the high priest, verse 2 of Acts chapter 9, and asked letters from the from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he, he might find anyone who were of the way. That was, that was the, the believers were called those of the way back in those days. They, uh, they weren't called Christians back then, not until Antioch. When the community turned on the way uh, in Antioch, they created a derogatory term. It's a nasty word. And they said, you know what? We're going to call these people Christians. It's a bad word. It means little Jesuses. <laughs> Oh, look at you, you little Christ-like ones. 
It was a derogatory term. But the early church said, well, we know how you mean that, but we kind of like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll be little Jesuses in our world. That's what we're supposed to do anyways, follow him. But the Bible tells us that he's out to persecute those who are of the way, whether they be men or women, and he, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Why? For their hearing and for their trial and stoning. Because Christianity was viewed as a cult in those days. The religious hierarchy viewed any challenge of the resurrection, that crucifixion, that somehow fulfilled the ancient Hebrew prophecies, they wouldn't even go there. That's why still today many synagogues will not teach on Old Testament prophecies that speak of the Messiah suffering for the sins of the world. Did you know that? They completely avoid it. Because they might, they're fearful that you might find out that Jesus is the one of the scriptures that spoke of him. But that's the man Saul threatening the church. Acts chapter uh, 22 verse 3 tells us later on, listen to this, Paul is now a Christian, he's come to Christ, he's a follower, and in Acts 22 3 he says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our fathers the law or our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all today. He's speaking regarding the passion that the Jews had, of course, to defend their traditions. Philippians chapter 3, you guys okay? Yes. We're just beginning, so write these down. Philippians chapter 3. Now, Paul has been a follower of Jesus for years, but listen to what he says. Philippians 3, verse 4. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh... I more so. Do you hear it? Listen, he's setting you up. Because people were talking about, well, I'm pretty good. Well, I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Paul says, excuse me. If you guys all think you're pretty good, listen to me. If anyone thinks he's something, listen to this. Verse 5. I'm, I've been circumcised on the eighth day. Every Jew would have went, oh, wow. I, I was circumcised on the ninth day. Paul said, not me. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's, the, that's, that's what Moses said to do. That's what happened to me. So all the Jews would have went, wow, that's something. Of the stock of Israel, my lineage can be traced back. Wow, they would have said. Of the tribe of Benjamin, what? Tribe of Benjamin? Man, that's where kings come from. Paul said, those are my peeps. <laughs> I got the blood of kings flowing in me. And he says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. At that, that is such a huge statement that he's talking about. There's us who are Hebrews, you know, but I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm a leader of the Hebrew world. And nobody could refute this, friends. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. I had the authority. I had the power. I had the education. I had it all, is what Paul is announcing. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Can you imagine saying that? He literally believed that according to the law, he was blameless. That's how established this man was. So if you want to put your good works up against Paul and say that, you know what? I don't need Jesus. I'm good. I'm good like Paul. Paul's the one who would tell you from antiquity, hey, don't put me in your camp. You're not even close to my camp. <laughs> Paul would say to you and I today, I'm so far above anything you're trying to be. It's ridiculous. Go home. In other words, we would say, he's arrived. That's pretty powerful. So I built him up according to the scripture as Paul announces. But look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's a statement of humility. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. You know what this word means? All of the things I just spoke to you about when I met Jesus Christ, all that stuff became absolutely nothing. Why? Because of this reason. I was once Saul and now I'm Paul. I thought I was something and everybody wanted me. Then I found out meeting Jesus, I'm of no significance. In the grand scheme of things, it's all about him. And to kind of bring that together, Acts chapter 13, verse 9 says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. And Paul was involved in ministry right there at that moment. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. But here's the Bible in Acts 13, 9, telling us that the man Saul is the same man Paul. And I love that. People, listen up. How many of you are Christians this morning? Raise your hands. According to God... According to God, there's a, name, there's a name that you had before you came to Christ, and there's a new name that you, uh, that you have, according to God. I, I want you to know that. You may not know your new name yet. I don't know, I don't know my new name. God says in the Bible, he's going to give us a new name. Now, some of you have wonderful names. Well, good for you. Uh, <laughs> but back there in Acts 13, I appreciate that the Bible says, Saul, who is called Paul speaks about what should always be before us. We need to remember from where we've come. Amen. That you and I, right now, until Christ comes for us, you and I live in two worlds at the same time. You and I live in the world that you and I came from. But you and I also live in a world that you and I now belong to. And one of them, we went by a certain name. And everybody in this world or in our sphere of influence or friendship or circle knew our name. And uh, by the way, this church, people visit. I went to people from junior high that I went to junior high school. They come and visit now. Is it you? Is that really you, Jack? <laughs> it's pretty scary because there's some high school friends now who attend this church. <laughs> and um, one of them a couple weeks ago said, God does do miracles. <laughs> And uh, it was in the foyer, and I didn't even want to talk to her. I just like, have, have a nice day. <laughs> but listen, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, in Revelation 3, 12, Jesus is speaking to his church, and he says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Watch, everyone. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Here it is, number two. I will write on him my new name. So which one is it? It's both. Jesus is speaking to you and he's saying, you know what? I'm going to write on you the name of my God. Remember, Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh and resurrected from the dead, glorified flesh. Jesus today in heaven is the God-man, 100% God, 100% man representing us. When Jesus says, he's my God, he's representing us in the flesh. Are you with me? He's the great go-between. So he's saying, I'm going to write on you the name of my God, and I'm going to write on you my name. Now, I don't know about you growing up. I think maybe I do. But I grew up, I grew up, I think the last, I had the last generation of fun growing up, I think, in my opinion. I grew up in the best time. And during that time, <laughs> right, during that time, uh, we actually had school. Everybody in the whole world had school like this. We all had summer off at the same time. Remember that? And uh, it was fantastic. And uh, anyway, all summer long, we played army. We played army. We'd all, we'd all ride our bikes to the Army-Navy uh, store. We'd buy all kinds of junk. We'd wear Army clothes all summer long. We had helmets that were way too big for our head. We're wearing Army jackets that we had buy. We'd play, we played Army with what? With our massive collection of G.I. Joes. <laughs> I had every G.I. Joe. I had them all. I had them all. And so did my, uh, my neighbor friends. We all had them. And we, all summer long we had war. And we knew how to do it. Back in those days, listen, back in those days, we literally 
You had GI Joes with, with firecrackers as for di dynamite sticks. We were blowing stuff up. We, we would have, we put dirt stuff with a tube of glue underneath and light it up and then blow the tractor up when it come by. And it was, you know what? It was living, man. That was life. It was awesome. We grew up having a ball. And uh, here's the thing. At the end of the day, we're loading up our GI Joes and our GI Joe carrying cases. <laughs> and what was amazing, I learned very quickly is, wait, wait, wait I'm missing a GI Joe. <laughs> that ain't going to happen again. I took all my GI Joes home took all their shirts off, put them face down, and I put Jack on the back of my G.I. Joes, put his clothes back on, and went to war the next day, and then at the end, we're counting them up and dividing them up. So wait a minute, I'm, I'm short, I'm short again. Oh, no, no, you're not. No, that's it. Shirt's off. <laughs> Shirt's off right now. And all I had to do, listen, all I had to do was look for this. If Joe said Jack, then you've got to give it back. All Joe had on his back was Jack. Why? Because I wrote on him a new name. It wasn't Joe, it was Jack. I gave him the name and I put it on him. My friends didn't know, I knew. I sovereignly knew who belonged to me and who didn't. Why? Because my name was written on them. And God says, I've written my name upon you. I have marked you and called you out by my name. And so your name might have been Saul. Your name might have been Saul, but now it's Paul. And by the way, when God renames you, it always goes to a more humble place to remind us that all the glory belongs to him. And so I don't know what my new name is going to be in heaven. He hasn't revealed that to me, uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm very happy. Uh, Jack is not the best name to have if you want to get into meanings. You know, Saul meant that and Paul meant the other. Let's be honest. My name, people, it's not easy. It's not easy. Nobody wants to say hi to me on an airplane. I'm just saying. It doesn't go over well. They just nod. Nobody says a word. And then the other thing is, um, people say, no, it's okay, it's okay, because your name is probably John, right? On your birth certificate, on your passport, it's John, right? No, it's Jack. That's my real name. Oh, really? Well, that's okay. So, so somebody has the meaning of their wonderful name. My name, my name, what, Jack. Listen, it's so bad people say, man, this thing's all jacked up. <laughs> that doesn't help. Or, you don't know Jack. It's very offensive. I'm always offended. And then on top of it is if you look up Jack, it's an, it's an implement or a tool by which you can lift heavy objects. It gets worse. <laughs> it is one of the members of the equine family. <laughs> if I have to explain equine to you, I'm not going to tell you what it means. God will give us a new name, but here is where you and I revel, church, in the fact of a new name. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, that he, Jesus, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Listen now. Saul lived for Saul. Paul lived for Jesus. But for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. In other words, we knew him when Jesus walked on earth, but now he's ascended to heaven, and that's our focus. In other words, he's been glorified. Christ is risen. That's our identity now with him. He's Christ above. He is our Savior, our Lord, our King, our Redeemer. He's up there. That's why it says we do not regard him after the flesh. But listen, it gets, to me, it gets even better. When he says we don't regard anyone or of ourselves according to the flesh any longer. To me, this is one of the most attractive reasons why, many reasons why, but an attractive reason why church is so precious. According to scripture, in this passage I'm reading, 
Listen to what it says and let me revisit. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Meaning what? Meaning this. You and I in church, a church family, we are to be a people who do not know one another's past. It doesn't exist. You say, well, that's kind of weird. Really? Really? Don't you wish that, there's a, that the world did not know certain things that the world knows about you? Don't you wish you could go back and erase some things of your past? Well, guess what? The answer is in the church of the living God. None of us should walk into this place and meet somebody and say, hey, what's your name, Bill? Hi, Bill. Can you tell me about your past? <laughs> that would be so weird and so not church. You know what the great thing is? Look at, look at this place. It's packed out with what? With who? If I were to tell you, if I told you what I knew. No, I would never do that. You could be sitting next to a murderer. You could be sitting next to a thief. The glorious thing is this. That's what they used to be. See, we don't regard one another anymore after the flesh. Now, if the world understood this, I think the world would blow up our walls and run in here to try to be like us. Say, wait a minute, you guys are willing to completely forget about my past? Yeah, as long as, let's let's just have this agreement. I'll forget about your past if you forget about my past. That's why when people from my old life walk into this church, it's unspoken. I look at them, they look at me, and it's like, (laughs) not a word. Why? It's under the blood. It's washed away. That's not me. That's, listen, that was Saul. Now it's Paul. A different name, a different life. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Why? Why, Jeremiah, are you so excited about reading the Bible? Oh, because of this. I'm called by your name. Oh, Lord of hosts. Oh, God of hosts. That you're hidden in Christ. It's absolutely awesome, which brings us to the response. Watch, everyone. If this love, grace, and mercy is available to you, that God changes names because he changes lives. He takes what you once were, and he uses that to glorify himself and make you new. That your old life has done away, behold, all things have become new, is the greatest news that the world could hear today. They've got to hear it. And that comes through us. There's no other way for them to hear it. Well, listen. What is he he doing? He's bringing us to this. All of this regarding this tremendous word regarding authority is this word bondservant. Look in your Bible. Circle that word bondservant. I don't want to belabor this, but I've got to be blunt and exactly to the point. Some of your Bible translations, instead of a word that it is, Slave? It's supposed to be slave. The bondservant is doulos in Greek, and it means slave. In our day and age, you're not even supposed to mention the word slave. Well, I'm going to mention the word slave. Hear me out. Slave means you have no rights, you have no choice, you have no recourse, you're owned. Are you with me? Slave. Some of the publishers of Bibles change the word to what's in your Bible? Servant. Servants get paid. (laughs) Servants can get days off. Uh, Servants can move on to a different occupation or a different master, so to speak. It's the wrong word. The word is slave, and we've got to keep it at slave, or else we're going to rob God of the glory, and here's the reason why. Paul is saying, I'm writing to you Romans. Tens of millions of you are slaves. Watch. I'm a slave. The Romans might shout back, shout back to Paul and say, yeah, right. I have no rights. I'm owned by my master. Sometimes he beats me. Sometimes he starves me. I have no life. I'm not even sure about my name. I'm a slave in the Roman Empire. And Paul says, I am too. I'm a slave. I'm in the Roman Empire. 
But I want to tell you something about my master. That's the difference. Watch. A slave of this world does not willingly submit to his earthly master. He obeys because he would rather obey than die. Are you hearing me? Paul uses where they're at and he says to them, you want to become a slave even lower than the slave that you are? Let me explain. There's absolute freedom and liberty in becoming someone insignificant in the face of or in the presence of a master like I have. Listen, all of us in this room are slaves of someone or something, even if that someone is you, a slave of yourself. That's death. Maybe this message gets out to the part of the world where someone is a slave on the market today somewhere in the world. Paul the Apostle is saying, Slave or not, the greatest liberty and freedom of all is to become a slave, watch this, not by a master buying you off of the market and saying, you're mine now, carry this load. Oh, no, no. Paul is going to say, my master is a master of character and quality to the point where he didn't make me a slave. When I found out about who he is, I made myself his slave. Friends, this is Christianity. The world will rob you, kill you, and destroy you. And when we're hurt, we respond by boarding up our emotions and boarding up our lives and hiding from all of it. And God comes along and says, let's tear all of it down because I'm your master. Tear all of it down. I'll take care of you. And when you see that love, that, listen, he's the one that forgives. I mentioned this some time ago, but remember the woman that was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8? When Jesus forgave her, don't you think emotionally and faith-filled wise that she became his slave in spirit, so to speak? She may never have seen Jesus again, but that kind of love caused her to say, I'll go anywhere and do anything he says I submit. And that's Christianity, friends. That's being a Christian. That's him writing his name on you. And you having a master that is so joyously beautiful to submit to. And listen to this. What's precious about that is a quote that I had that I can't find now. It was really good, too. By Dr. Charles Ryrie. To literally become his slave is to be bound to him of your own will. The believer who voluntarily takes the position of being a slave to Christ has no rights or will of his own. He does always and only the will of his master. For his part, that is the master's part, the Lord binds himself to the care of his servant or of his slave. This is Christianity. Why should I become a Christian? Because you become a slave. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Because our master is awesome. Our master loves us. Our master cares. Being his slave is the greatest freedom you can ever experience. You need, listen, you need to replace your masters, friends. If your master is mammon, It'll never be satisfied. If your master is sex, it will never be satisfied. If your master is power, they'll never be enough. You'll never be content. If your master lords over you and extracts and demands performance from you, you'll never be free. But when the master Jesus comes and says, come, follow me, he's inviting you to walk with him. And he just begins to do it. He begins to work his life in your life. A tremendous word, bondservant. The Bible tells us regarding this man, Paul, who had this tremendous encounter. It's a glorious moment of wills being changed. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. Acts 9, 3, listen to this. Paul is in that mode. I should say Saul. He's not converted yet. He's gotten letters from Jerusalem, from the hierarchy. He's a Pharisee. 
and he's got uh, documents for the empire to go to Damascus, Syria to hunt down Christians and kill them if he must. Imagine now, he's in route, he's, in, he's with an entourage, we know this from other portions of scripture, there's a, there's a bunch of people with him. You could just see this happening, right? They're probably black, black, they're wearing black, black donkeys, black tinted windows, black antennas on the back of the donkeys. And they're heading to Damascus to hunt Christians. And verse 3 says that as they journeyed, they came near to Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Isn't that weird? What did Saul do to Jesus? You see, when the church is attacked, Jesus is attacked. And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said to him, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. That's a great statement. Paul, what are you doing? Saul. It's me. You're persecuting me. Now, I want to remind you about something. Think of a barefoot kicking against a, a, a goad is a, think of a two by four with 16 penny nails c- coming through it. Nails, a bunch of nails, and it's a board. And you take your foot and you keep kicking that board. That's what it means. So Jesus says to Saul, what are you doing kicking the board that's riddled with nails? You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to succeed. You're just going to bloody yourself. What a challenge. Look what happens. Verse 6, so Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's it. The change just took place. What would you have me to do? Do you understand that this man's life, this guy's responsible for killing Christians? I don't care what kind of past you've had. No matter what it is. Can you imagine Paul living his Christian life, and he wakes up in the morning, and the thought enters his mind that 17 years ago, he's got pictures in his mind of where he had Christians beheaded or stoned. He watched Stephen. He remembered the first Christian killed. He was there in Jerusalem, and it was Stephen. And Paul oversaw the killing of Stephen. You think that's in his mind? Don't you think Satan brought that up to him all the time? What makes you think, Paul, ooh, Saul, who's now Paul, that he's going to forgive you? Look at you. Why would God have you in heaven? No wonder why the tremendous verses, like a few I'm going to read you in a moment, was part of Paul's diet of life and great sense of victory. No wonder why he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Saul met someone greater than himself. And the Saul world came tumbling down until the only thing that was left was on his face in the dirt, Paul. And that's what has to happen to us if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven, is to have that crisis of faith and to meet Jesus Christ. It's got to happen. You don't sign on and sign Christ on and get your card-carrying membership of the what club I do not know and think you're going to be granted entrance into heaven. There needs to be an absolute devastation where you see yourself in the face of God for all the truth of it. And you say, I need him. I, you and I need to experience that trembling astonishment where we surrender and become that slave where I am lost without you, Jesus. How I need you. And in that moment, your name will be changed. Your nature will be changed. The power of that. How is it that Christians, I saw it this week in the news, how Christians in North Africa are being killed because they will not deny Jesus as Lord. Why? Why are they doing this? Because they cannot do anything else. They they can't lie against the truth. They just 
They're being asked to denounce Christ, and they're saying, I can't do it. I mean, I could say it, but I won't mean it. Do you have that conviction for each and every one of us? If you don't know what that's like, if somebody walked into this room and said, everyone who's not a Christian, get out, quick, run. I'm going to kill every Christian in here. They did that in Nazi Germany. What would you do? I can tell you right now, the grace of God will come upon his people. And uh, we'll say something to them like, look, we'd appreciate it if you're a very good aim. Don't wound me. Look, I'm not even going to run around. Just, I'll stand still. Just aim good, will you? Why? Because first of all, I'm living for Jesus. And then listen, second of all, I die for Christ. It's by his grace. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Okay? But we need that encounter because in this day and age, that's the confidence that we need. You say, well, Jack, how do, how, do I, how do I maintain that? How do I know that life? How do I be a Christian? I'm glad you asked. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Watch this. I got to tell you, this should be committed to memory for all of us. I'm talking about the Christian life now. Here's how we live every day. This is Paul's go-to verse every day of his life. Are you guys with me? You're very quiet. Are you here? Okay. Galatians 2.20, watch, now watch, I have been crucified, three statements, all in past tense, I have been crucified with Christ, Amen. so what, wait, wait a minute, I've been crucified with Christ, mm -hmm. listen, when you're crucified, you die. I've been crucified with Christ. Yet, look, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Let me explain this for a second. Um, this happens this way. After, let's pretend after church this morning, you're going to go get something to eat. And you're, how are you going to do that? You're going to go somewhere, and you are going to probably use a, a debit card or a credit card uh, even if you were to write a check or do a transaction or these, these new apps, there's no money exchange, but you do it. You eat, you pay for it, you go. How did that happen, honestly? How in the world did that happen? What just happened when you do that? What happened was there was money in an account somewhere that was transferred over to the merchant for the services rendered. You paid for that, all right? You had to have money in the account to pay for your expense. But are you tracking with me? This is Christianity. Jesus Christ on the cross, who died there and then rose again from the dead, deposited in your account the riches of Christ. And the riches of Christ, in this case, is your identity. And he did that at the cross 2,000 years ago. It's there for the unbeliever that's not yet come to Christ. It's sitting there. It's all been paid for, but they never tap into it. But the moment you come to Christ, what happens? When he says, I've been crucified with Christ, but it's not me who lives. Christ lives in me. What happens? Christ's righteousness is in that account that's labeled with your name. God takes it and puts it into your new name, your new account... And God looks at the account and says, there's sufficient funds there. Amen. How did that happen? God paid for it, God provided it, and God transferred it. That's why Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's all about him. It's him. And when you realize, watch, when a bad thought, when a bad desire, when lust, anger, you name it, when it pops up, this is what you do. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Mm -mm, not good. This is not good. This is not going to go in a good, good way. Lord, I'm reminding myself I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It is not I, but Christ who lives in me. And so because of that, because Christ lives in me, I am going to say right now to that temptation, to that person, to that thing, no way. 
That's not, I don't want it. I want it away from me. I belong to him. I'm dead to that. I'm alive to Christ. Jesus is living in me. And Jesus says no to that. And I'm not going to go to that bottle when life gets rough. And I'm not going to do it. And when you take a stand, then Christ's power comes. That's just the way it is. Take a stand, then his power comes. That's called faith. Every day, walking by faith. Take a stand, make the statement, hold your ground, then the faith comes. The faith will not be there until you take a stand. You got, your, got to put your foot in the water, Moses, before the sea parts. Does that make sense? It's very important. Which leads us to this, commissioning. Look at verse 1. Called to be an apostle. Calling. Called. The word called means by invitation. That you've been brought in. God invites you. I love how God never puts you in a headlock. He's always inviting you. Paul is saying, I've been called to be an apostle. Called an apostle. Christ invited me. And Jesus invites everyone who follows him. He invites them. Every one of us, he invites to come. That is so significant. So powerful. Another thing that is very uh, strong about what is being said here is when God calls, you say, well, when does God call? Well, according to God, God calls us before we were ever created. Did you know that? It's pretty wild. Uh, I'm going to give you this verse. I love this verse. Um, when I was a brand new believer, I came across this verse. And because of my, my past, my background, not background, not my background, but my, my beginnings, uh, I grabbed onto it. And it's Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It's my verse, but you can have it too if you need it. <laughs> but Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5, we talk about calling and being called. I have no doubt that every one of you who named the name of Jesus, I have no doubt of your calling whatsoever. You may doubt your calling. I don't doubt your calling. For this reason. As a new believer, I read this. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That got my attention. What? Before you were born. Well, wait, Jesus, before I was born, I was a failed abortion attempt. I, um, wait, Jesus, before... You formed me in the womb, you knew me? Before I was born, you sanctified me? And so later on, I was born, you knew all this? Well, God, I don't know what this means, but I'd like you to live out that reality in my life because I survived an abortion, I was allowed to live into this world, and so you must have a plan for my pathetic life. So whatever you want to do, God, is okay with me because I was already scheduled to be dead. So I've had that sentence before. So whatever you want to do has got to be better than what the world was willing to do to me. Does it make sense? Yeah. So let's do this, Jesus. Amen. And with that, in my opinion... There's the authority that we come under God with, and now there's the commissioning of your life that he wants to use you. He's, your life for a purpose, dear friend. Amen. Don't underestimate his glory that he wants to live out in your life. And then finally, we end right here. Uh, we're called to be a new man because there's a greater purpose. The authority changes, the commissioning's different, and our purpose for living's completely different. He uses the word separated. Separated to the gospel of God. This is a tremendous word. It's not what you think. Separate. When you hear the word separated, you think of the word separate. Oh, you put that away. Separate it from all the rest and put it over here. This is so cool. This word is amazing. Are you guys listening? We're almost done. I want you to miss this. This word's amazing. Because it's separated. Watch. The word implies that it's something that is on a, a path that is very, very tiny with no view. It has no ability to see, and it's very confined. When this word separated to the gospel or separated to God, the word means to take you from a very, very bad view, 
you know, like getting a hotel at the beach, but the hotel faces the freeway. <laughs> is that not the worst? I think hell's going to be like that. <laughs> Just, what's worse than that? Oh, yo, oh, you went to Maui? Not really. The, the room faced the freeway. You're stuck. This word tells us that when you come to Christ under his authority, with his commissioning, you have a purpose. And the word separated means you come into a place that is not only massive and expanse, but the word implies that you elevate upward and look down at it all. So you could go, listen, you go down to John Wayne Airport, you can't see anything, you go through the terminal, you get into a, a metal tube, you sit there, strap yourself in, and you look out a little window, and you can't see nothing, right? Until what happens? Until it takes off. And then all of a sudden, that's how big the world is. Do you see? That's the word. That's the word, separated. When God takes his believer, their world is narrow. They don't have, they don't have anything. It's not, come on, it's, it's terrible compared to the expanse of what God gives. And with that is the purpose for living. And it is to live, breathe, and to promote the gospel of Jesus.